Good evening and welcome to the Four Lakes Church of Christ meeting in Madison, Wisconsin. We're very glad to have you with us tonight for our study of the book of Exodus. We've been in this study for a number of months now, and tonight we are ready for Exodus chapter 39. So this is the next to the last chapter, Exodus chapter 39. We want to invite you to be finding a Bible and turning with us to Exodus chapter 39. As always, if you have any questions or comments about tonight's class, if you have something that we need to be praying about as a congregation. We want to invite you to get in touch. You can send me a message to info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can also call or send a text to 608-224-0274. But as I said, tonight we are back to Exodus. We're getting very close to the end of it. God's people were freed from slavery in Egypt earlier in this book, and they are almost ready to leave Mount Sinai. But before they do, they are building the tabernacle, which they did over the last couple chapters. So tonight we come to the point where they finally get to make the garments for the priest, for the priest to wear as they serve during worship. And once again, I think tonight's study will most likely be a little bit shorter than most. So let's jump right into it tonight with the first paragraph. This is Exodus chapter 39, verses 1 through 7. Exodus 39, verses 1 through 7. Moreover, from the blue and purple and scarlet material, they made finely woven garments for ministering in the holy place, as well as the holy garments which for, were for Aaron, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. He made the ephod of gold and of blue and purple and scarlet material and fine twisted linen. Then they hammered out gold sheets and cut them into threads to be woven in with the blue and the purple and the scarlet material and the fine linen, the work of a skillful workman. They made attaching shoulder pieces for the ephod. It was attached at its two upper ends. The skillfully woven band which was on it was like its workmanship of the same material, of gold and of blue and purple and scarlet material and fine twisted linen, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. They made the onyx stones set in gold filigree settings. They were engraved like the engravings of a signet, according to the names of the sons of Israel, and he placed them on the shoulder pieces of the ephod as memorial stones for the sons of Israel just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Well, up at the beginning here, let's notice that they start with the blue and the purple and the scarlet material. So as I read this, it doesn't seem to me as if they had to create the material here, but rather they use what they have. And what they have had been given to them by the Egyptians on their way out on the night of the Passover as repayment for their years of slavery down in Egypt. But they take this fabric and they create garments for Aaron, the first high priest. And notice in verse 3, they hammer out sheets of gold, and then they cut those sheets into threads, and those threads are then to be woven into the existing fabric that they already have. And then they make the accessories. We have these shoulder pieces for the ephod, which is basically a vest. We had the instructions for this earlier in the book, and now they actually create it, complete with the stones, engraved with the names of the sons of Israel. So as the priests were serving, therefore, they would remember who they were representing before the Lord. And these onyx stones were mounted on the shoulder pieces of the ephod, just as God had commanded Moses. And uh, onyx is kind of an interesting stone. And uh, we have actually a street in the neighborhood where our church building is located that's named onyx. And then we have Kingston Onyx Park, a couple blocks straight west of our church facility. We've cleaned that park many times through the years on behalf of the neighbors over there. But I just want to point that out because we have this reference to onyx in the Bible. So I thought that was a little bit interesting. So let's continue then with Exodus 39 verses 8 uh, through 21. Exodus 39, 8 through 21. And this all goes together. He made the breast piece the work of a skillful workman, like the workmanship of the ephod, of gold and of blue and purple and scarlet material and fine twisted linen, it was square. They made the breast piece folded double, a span long and a span wide when folded double. And they mounted four rows of stones on it. The first row was a row of ruby, topaz, and emerald. And the second row, a turquoise, a sapphire, and a diamond. And the third row, a jacinth, an agate, and an amethyst. And the fourth row, a barrel, an onyx, and a jasper. They were set in gold filigree settings when they were mounted. 
The stones were corresponding to the names of the sons of Israel. They were 12 corresponding to their names, engraved with the engravings of a signet, each with its name for the 12 tribes. They made on the breastpiece chains like cords of twisted cordage work in pure gold. They made two gold filigree settings and two gold rings and put the two rings on the two ends of the breastpiece. Then they put the two gold cords in the two rings at the ends of the breastpiece. They put the other two ends of the two cords on the two filigree settings and put them on the shoulder pieces of the ephod at the front of it. They made two gold rings and placed them on the two ends of the breastpiece on its inner edge, which was next to the ephod. Furthermore, they made two gold rings and placed them on the bottom of the two shoulder pieces of the ephod on the front of it, close to the place where it joined, above the woven band of the ephod. They bound the breastpiece by its rings to the rings of the ephod with a blue cord, so that it would be on the woven band of the ephod, and that the breastpiece would not come loose from the ephod, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. So we now come to the breastpiece part of this. So this is made out of the same materials, gold, blue, purple, scarlet, and fine twisted linen. And on this breastpiece, they put four rows of precious stones for a total of 12 stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Some of these are familiar to us. Uh, amethyst, there, I don't know if any of you have ever been here up north of Duluth, up in Canada, there's an amethyst mine. I remember going there um, when I was a kid and uh, looking at that and doing some amethyst mining, I suppose. And uh, some of these other uh, stones may be familiar to us. Um, agate, those of course are found up along uh, Lake Superior. And, um, and this is all held together in place with a system of gold cords that pass through the rings and uh, very close to the chest. So this thing is most likely pretty heavy. It's woven with gold and precious stones. They certainly don't want to drop this thing or lose it. It was to be secured with these gold cords. As I was preparing for tonight's lesson, I thought back to something that I finally found on my trip out west last September. I've been doing some research for a year or two, uh, looking for a way to safely carry a phone. Um, some of you know my phone is absolutely huge. I bought it for the camera, but when you get a decent camera, the phone kind of tends to get rather large. So I got a huge camera and got to take that with me hiking and, and that. And then also to be able to carry even a firearm while hiking or running. And I kept hearing good things about some chest packs made by Hill People Gear. Uh, but I hesitated to make a purchase like that online due to not being able to try it on. If you know what I mean, it's hard to buy a piece of equipment without actually touching it and, and trying it on. So I had a lot of questions. So I looked them up and they're based out in Grand Junction, Colorado. Grand Junction, I think, is in uh, West Central Colorado. And that was on my way from the Bear Valley Lectures in Denver uh, on the way out to my sister's place in Washington. So I made sure to be passing through Grand Junction during business hours. And I got to try on some of their chest packs, got some great advice from a very helpful employee, got to make that pur purchase in person. Uh, but it is basically a pouch with two compartments. And I just think of this when I think of the ephod. I don't know if you can see this, uh, the kind of straps that would go over the shoulders and then a pouch with a couple uh, different uh, uh, separated places in it with zippers and uh, for carrying different things. But when I think of the ephod, now I think of this. And also has bottom cords to keep it from flopping around when you're running. But for now, whenever I read about the ephod in the Bible, I'll be thinking about that pack right here, which might have been very roughly the same size. Uh, another note here, as we think about those 12 stones, I also think back to the early days of the pandemic. Uh, when I would do the video from our garage in front of the wood pile, and I'd put pictures of the congregation tacked on the, on the wood. If you remember that, some of you were here then, we weren't together, but you were kind of looking over my shoulder in a sense. And I think it was kind of a reminder that we were a congregation, uh, even though we weren't meeting in person for a little while there. So maybe in a similar way, God has the priest wear this ephod with the names of the 12 tribes engraved on these stones. And the priest would then wear this into the tabernacle as he offered the various sacrifices. So the breast piece was this constant reminder that the priest was actually doing some serious work representing two to three million people before the Lord. Well, let's continue with Exodus 39 verses 22 through 31. Exodus 39, 22 through 31. Then he made the robe of the ephod of, ro of woven work, all of blue, and the opening of the robe was at the top in the center as the opening of a coat of mail with the binding all around its opening so that it would not be torn. They made pomegranates of blue and purple and scarlet material and twisted linen on the hem of the robe. 
They also made bells of pure gold and put the bells between the pomegranates all around on the hem of the robe, alternating a bell and a pomegranate all around on the hem of the robe for the service, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. They made the tunics of finely woven linen for Aaron and his sons, and the turban of fine linen, and the decorated caps of fine linen, and the linen breeches of fine twisted linen, and the sash of fine twisted linen, and blue and purple and scarlet material, the work of the weaver, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. They made the plate of the holy crown of pure gold, and inscribed it like the engravings of a signet, holy to the Lord. They fastened a blue cord to it to fasten it on the turban above, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. So now we come to the robe. As we learned uh, for the first time a few months ago, the opening of the robe is reinforced with chain mail. And as we noted then, this garment was designed to last for many generations. Uh, generally speaking, clothing doesn't last too long, does it? I mean, clothing has a way of wearing out. I don't know whether you have any clothing from your parents or grandparents, but going back beyond that, well, I would be surprised if you had any clothing from your great-great-grandparents because clothing wears out. It has a way of deteriorating. But uh, here, God has this clothing reinforced with chain mail so it is durable and it can be passed down from generation to generation. In verses 24 through 26, they make the pomegranates alternating with bells. And I don't know if we've thought about this, but you would hear this guy coming. The high priest would not be able to sneak up on anybody. This was some noisy clothing. Uh, and in the following verses, we find that they make similar garments for Aaron's sons as well. Special garments, tunics, caps, undergarments, sashes. And at the end of this paragraph, they also make a gold crown and engraved with the words, Holy to the Lord. So a reminder that the priest was holy and that he was doing the Lord's work when he was on duty. Well, let's conclude tonight with Exodus 39, verses 32 through 43. Exodus 39, 32 through 43. Thus, all the work of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting was completed, and the sons of Israel did according to all that the Lord had commanded Moses, so they did. They brought the tabernacle to Moses, the tent and all its furnishings, its clasps, its boards, its bars, and its pillars, and its sockets. And the covering of ram skins dyed red, and the covering of porpoise skins, and the screening veil, the ark of the testimony, and its poles in the mercy seat. The table, all its utensils, and the bread of the presence, the pure gold lampstand with its arrangement of lamps and all its utensils, and the oil for the light, and the gold altar, and the anointing oil, and the fragrant incense, and the veil for the doorway of the tent. The bronze altar and its bronze grating, its poles and all its utensils, the laver and its stand, the hangings for the court, its pillars and its sockets, and the screen for the gate of the court, its cords and its pegs, and all the equipment for the service of the tabernacle for the tent of meeting, the woven garments for ministering in the holy place, and the holy garments for Aaron the priest, and the garments of his sons to minister as priests. So the sons of Israel did all the work according to all that the Lord had commanded Moses. And Moses examined all the work, and behold, they had done it. Just as the Lord had commanded, this they had done. So Moses blessed them. If I've understood this passage correctly, it's almost like the people do all the work. They make all the tabernacle and the utensils and the furniture, the equipment, the garments, and now they present these things to Moses. It's almost like a commanding officer inspecting the troops or maybe like a supervisor examining the work uh, done by those who were hired to get something done, making sure that it was done correctly. And in verse 42, the people do the work according to what God had commanded Moses. And in verse 43, Moses examines everything. And I love how it says, behold, they had done it, just as the Lord had commanded this, they had done. And so to me, after everything these people have been through with the golden calf incident, it's almost as if Moses is pleasantly surprised. <laughs> they actually did the thing that they were commanded to do. They get it. They get it done. They seem to be serious about following God's instructions on this. And at the end, the text says that Moses blesses them. He approves of what has been done here. Well, this brings us to the very end of Exodus 39. Next week, we hope to finish the book by taking a look at Exodus 40, the very last chapter. But again, thank you for joining us tonight. Again, if you have any questions or comments about the class, if there's some way we can help, something we can do to encourage you, uh, if there's something we need to be praying about, get in touch. Send me an email, info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can also send a text or give me a call at 608-224-0274, and we would love to hear from you. As we close tonight, let's go to God in prayer. 
Our Father in heaven, you are the one and only great and awesome God, creator of heaven and earth. And we praise you tonight for all that you've done to bridge the gap between us and to establish a relationship. In ancient times, as we've studied tonight, you arranged for the construction of a tent. You gave instructions for this uh, place of worship where your people could meet with you in the wilderness. Today, you've revealed yourself to us through your only son who came to this earth to conquer sin and death, making us a part of your kingdom, the church. Thank you, Father, for adopting us into your family, for causing us to be born again to a new and living hope. Thank you, Father, for loving us, and thank you for Jesus. We come to you tonight in his name. Amen. <laughs> 